I'm going to title this lesson, uh, Diversity and Unity. We're not going to be able to cover all of chapter 12 today because we're going to do a little bit of review. It's been a couple weeks since we've done that. But this idea that in the unified body, which we were talking about last week in the Lord's Supper, about how we're all supposed to be one, and that's what we just proclaimed is our unity, there's a lot of diversity in this body. And so there's, how do you maintain such unity when you have such diversity at the same time? There may be a temptation to all conform and, and all be like cookie cutter and be exactly the same person, you know, just, just different you know, names on different people, but they all look the same. And that's not how it is. We're all diverse, and that's exactly how God has designed it. So let's kind of review um, like we have been in the past. I, I think that this is very helpful if we keep just through repetition as a good teaching tool. Is in chapter 1, we have this introduction to how we're all called together and made holy in Christ, and it's Christ that's done that. Uh, the temptation was that they were exalting, you know, Paul or Cephas or Apollos, one over another, exalting men, or they were exalting this wisdom. And I actually, in uh, chapter 1, he talks about how they were given all knowledge and all wisdom, but it's talking about spiritual wisdom. He's going to talk about those two things again in chapter 12. And <coughs> they were looking for the wrong things. They put their faith in the wrong things. Uh, when Paul came to them, he came to them in weakness. And the reason he said he did that in chapter 2 was that so their faith would be in God's power and not just some show of strength, not signs and not wonders. And he was saying that um, even it doesn't come through God's wisdom, that God's wisdom really is revealed by the Spirit. And so if we're thinking spiritually, and we're talking about thinking spiritually this morning in our Bible class, if we're thinking spiritually, we're going to really be looking at uh, God's wisdom in a spiritual sense. So spiritual people will be accepting God's spiritual wisdom. The irony here is that in chapter 3, he, re he says that you, know, you can't be spiritual and divided. And in chapter 12, we're talking about diversity and unity. They, they were diverse, but they, so they were so divided, and they were, there's this theme of pride that's going through the whole book about them exalting themselves over one another or exalting certain men above another. And so he has to correct this false view of servants. He's saying, you know, we're all just servants, and all these Paul and Apollos and Cephas, they were all just sent uh, to be servants uh, for you. One waters, you know, one plants, one waters. It's God that gives the increase. All laying this one foundation, that's Jesus Christ. No other foundation can be laid. And he gives this warning again that anybody who destroys the work of God's building, God's going to destroy that person. And at the end, he says, you know, all of these things are Christ, and all of these things belong to you, so there's no need fighting over them. He reminds them that Christ is going to be judging his servants. And there's this illustration of a, somebody who's a caretaker of a household and how the manager of that household will judge their performance. Perhaps in response to some of their criticisms against Paul, perhaps uh, he has to straighten out some of their views of what a servant is, and so he goes into this example about how the apostles... They have been just beat up, and a servant is not what they think a servant is. It's not some, always some glorious thing. Servants actually serve, and sometimes it's rough business. And so that's what he was talking about when he gives the apostles and what they've been going through. And at the end of that, he just gives this appeal. He, is, he kind of changes from this, this, hard, uh, uh, this hard criticism of them to this loving appeal as a father. And he says, you know, I really want to come to you with a spirit of gentleness. I don't want to have to come to you with a rod. And so... In chapter 5, he turns the attention to something that they need to address, but they've been lacking addressing, and that is immorality in their midst. In this case, it was a man who was involved in sexual immorality, and he was saying that they need to put that man out of their midst. The example was of the Passover. Uh, when they, uh, Nathan talked about the Passover this morning, in celebration of that, they would get rid of everything that was, had leaven in it in their house so they could celebrate that feast in purity, because leaven uh, was the illustration of sin. <clears throat> in the New Testament, he's saying when you come together and celebrate Christ as your Passover, you need to be doing that in purity. So all this immorality is immoral people who aren't repenting. You have to get rid of those people out of your midst. And so he exhorts them to judge those people who are within. Chapter 6 was another problem they had. That was bringing shame on the church by people taking each other to court and publicly embarrassing the church. And he gives a long list of wrongdoers uh, that bring shame on God's church. And he says, these people are not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And later in the chapter, he says, you know, with your body, we're all individually members of the Lord's body. So we can't be joining ourselves to immorality and use the example of a harlot. We have to join ourselves to the Lord. We have to be mastered not by our desires, but by the Lord's desires. 
and we have to decide whether or not we're going to glorify God with our body or use our body for dishonor. If we're going to use our body for dishonor, we're not going to be able to glorify God, and we're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Well, there was some uh, confusion, perhaps, to them about what total devotion to God looked like, total devotion to Christ. So in chapter 7, he gives instructions about uh, sexual relations. He says to the married, you can't be celibate. You have to fulfill each other's sexual desires. To the unmarried, people who are widows, he said that it was better for them to just give undivided attention to God, but if they had strong desires, it wasn't a sin for them to marry. People who were married, they should not be, Christians who should marry shouldn't be initiating the divorce. They should be staying with their partners, uh, with, their, with their husbands or with their wife. And if somebody was married to an unbeliever, somebody was unfaithful, he's saying don't, don't separate from them either. Uh, stay with them as long as they're willing to stay with you. So the guiding principle here was remain as you are. Serve God where you are. Don't think that you can serve God better and that you're limited by your current circumstances. And don't use that as an excuse. He's saying singleness, if you're able to do it, is preferred because it's total devotion, but it's not a sin. He gives some reasons for being single, um, but marriage in the end is, is not a sin. And in chapter 8, what they were having is they were exalting their knowledge again. In this case, they were exalting knowledge over things sacrificed to idols. Idols are fake. There's only one God. It doesn't, doesn't make a big deal, so I'm going to go and I'm going to celebrate along with these pagan feasts and eat the meat sacrificed to idols. Maybe even encourage weaker brethren to attend with me. He's saying that's not real love. The content of Christian knowledge is about Christ, Him crucified. And so we do things. We don't just exercise our rights. We do things to build up others. And really, it's care for our other brethren, not exalting our own liberties and our own rights. And then, he, he, by, by extension of that, he defends his own apostleship and talks about his own rights as an apostle, and then his own restraint in using them. Uh, so really, all of chapter 9 is him applying the principles that he was teaching in chapter 8 to himself as an example, was that he had these rights, but he, he did not exercise all these rights. Um, and then he says how he does use his freedom, and that was to save as many people as he can. And he gives this example about racing, you know, running the race uh, like you're going to win it, and boxing as in beating yourself into subjection uh, to Christ. In chapter 10, <coughs> he turns his example to Israel, how the Israelites, they were promised good things when they came out of Egypt, but they didn't make it into the promised land because they grumbled against God, they turned to idolatry. And so he gives this warning against idolatry, again, going back to chapter 8, them being caught up in these, being, you know, they, maybe they weren't, they weren't exactly pagan themselves, but they were rubbing elbows with pagans, and that was exactly what happened to the Israelites. They got too cozy with the things of the world, and they end up becoming idolaters as well. He says, you can't sit down at both tables. You can't sit down at the Lord's Supper, that table, and you can't, and, and share also with these, these idols, because both people are having fellowship with some, something. When you go to this big raucous party, even though you don't believe in an idol, you're participating in that, and you're showing by your presence participation in it, the same way you do when you come to the Lord's Supper. And really, at the end of the chapter, he says, do all to God's glory. He says, if everything you do, do everything to God's glory. And so it's kind of a reminder that ties chapter 8 all the way to chapter 10 uh, into this nice package by, by bringing all that together. Chapter 11, which was a lesson I preached back in April, and I invited you to listen to that, um, the, I think the tie between chapter 10 and chapter 11 is doing everything to God's glory. And in the beginning, he talks about headship and how um, man is the glory of God and woman is the glory of man. And so he gives this teaching about coverings, about how a man shouldn't pray or prophesy with his head covered, and the opposite being true for the woman. She shouldn't pray or prophesy uncovered. And then he appeals to propriety. He appeals to uh, the nature of man, a creation order, the angels, and uh, we talked about the difficulties of what that might mean. He appeals to their best judgment, which we've seen him do to the past. In chapter 10, he says, judge for yourself is not the bread we break, the body of Christ. So he's appealing to what they should know. He appeals to what nature teaches them. They could abu uh, observe in nature what nature teaches about woman having long hair and man uh, not, uh, generally speaking. And then he appeals to what the apostles uh, teach in every church and what the churches practice everywhere else um, in that day. And so that finishes out all the way from chapter 11, 2 down through 16. And then we went in last week and talked about abuses of the Lord's Supper, <coughs> about how they were 
really turning it into an opportunity to fulfill their own uh, desire for food. It wasn't about a proclamation of unity. He reminds them that Christ died so that we could all be unified in one body. That's not what was happening at the Lord's Supper there. They weren't even thinking about being unified or, or really thinking about Christ. They were thinking about themselves. So again, he reiterates what he originally learned from Christ and what he had delivered, which was this was a remembrance of the Lord. It was a memorial to the Lord. And you need to discern the body properly, the body that Christ died for, which I believe he's talking about the church there. Uh, as a result of them not discerning the body properly, there were some things that were happening to them that he's saying was near-term judgments and was designed for them uh, to turn them back so that they were not going to be caught up in the judgment with the world. And then he finalizes with this exhortation to wait for another, one another when they come together. So they're not coming together for the worse, they're coming together for the better. And that brings us to chapter 12. Um, a little bit of an intro there. So if you turn to chapter 12 in 1 Corinthians, we need to think about uh, this problem. How do we unify so much diversity that's among us? You know, we are very diverse in a body. In fact, if it wasn't for Christ, none of us would know each other, most likely. None of us would, you know, probably spend that much time together. It's the thing that unifies us. It's the thing that brings us together. How do we unify us when we're all so different and God has blessed us with different abilities? Well, today's outline is in three parts. The first one is we need to remember that Jesus is Lord. He is the master. That is one of the things that helps us to be unified because we're going to be doing his will. We're going to talk about the need for this variety or diversity in the body and then diversity in a unified body and how that works. So the first thing is Jesus is Lord. In the first three verses here in chapter 12, he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, so he's picking up a new, a new problem that was most likely written in their letter. And uh, in the original it says, <coughs> in my New American Standard Version, it has gifts in italics. So he's saying, now concerning spiritual, or most translations may say spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware or ignorant or not know something. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So let's look at this. Now, he's saying, now concerning spiritual gifts, so he's bringing up a new topic. And gifts is probably too narrow a translation, as most people add the word gifts there. It's um, probably spiritual things or things of the Spirit It would be a better translation. So he's, he's transitioning to things of the Spirit. And uh, most translators, I understand why they put in gifts there, because he's going to go on to talk about different manifestations there. But I think he's probably <coughs> leaving it open so that you can make a broader application. Now concerning spiritual things, he, he's, he's kind of... He's kind of doing something like that there in verse 1. Now, we've talked about how this, this transitional phrase, and concerning, is, is, provides different markers throughout the book. And concerning things you wrote, chapter 7, verse 1, indicated that they had written a letter about some things. Uh, 7.25 says concerning virgins, or the betrothed that we talk about in chapter 7. <coughs> chapter 8 says concerning things sacrificed to idols, most likely something that they had written to them about. Here in chapter 12, we have concerning spiritual things. And then chapter 16, 1, concerning the collection for the saints. You're familiar with that? We read that one a lot on Sundays. And then concerning Apollos, chapter 16 and verse 12. So I've tried to share this slide every time we come up with one of these to so just remind you that we're moving on to different sections here. He starts out by saying, I don't want you to be unaware. And the idea here is there's a play on words going on that you might miss because he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. And then in chapter 2, he says, you know. So I don't want you to be unaware or ignorant. Uh, I don't think he's telling them something that they don't know. He's just reminding them of something that they already know. If you go back to chapter 10 and verse 1, he says, <clears throat> I don't want you to be unaware. The same phrase is used in 10.1 as he's using here in 12.1. And what does he say in 10.1? I don't want you to be unaware that our fathers, and he talks about how the fathers uh, went under the cloud and passed through the sea. Something that they already knew. So my point is, he's reminding them of something they already know, but he wants them to ha understand a deeper meaning of it. Sometimes we know things, but we don't apply the knowledge appropriately. And that was what was happening in chapter 10. They knew the story about 
the Israelites and how they got in trouble when they left Egypt. But he was wanting them to apply that knowledge to themselves. <clears throat> Here, they, they, there's something that they already know, and that is this idea of their pagan past. So in chapter 12 and verse 2, he says, You know, and he's reminding them of, that they were pagans. He says, You know that you were led astray to mute idols. And so they know this. Again, this is some indication that it was a largely Gentile audience here in Corinth. <clears throat> now, the danger here is being led astray by things that are fake. Now, what happened to them when they were pagan idols? How did the worship go? Well, they would go there. We don't know everything about pagan worship, but they were really sincerely fooled into thinking that those were gods. They, there may have been some kind of fake tricks, like magic show things, fake miracles, uh, maybe even fake uh, manifestations of a god. And in light of what he's going to be talking about here is speaking in tongues. Uh, he's talking about spiritual gifts, manifestations of a gift that could be leading people astray, which I think has a great application today when a lot of people claim to speak in tongues, but it's not really authentic. So why is he saying this? He's wanting them to call back in their minds something that used to happen to them when they were led astray following pagan idols. He says, you know that you were led astray to mute idols. Therefore, which is the conclusion of this argument in, in verse 3, I'm going to make known to you something so they won't be ignorant. He says, no one speaking in the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. Now, maybe this was something that was occurring at the pagan feasts. I don't know. Maybe, the, maybe the, the, even though they didn't believe in these pagan idols, maybe if you went to a pagan feast, other people were calling Jesus cursed. Not really sure, but I do understand the second part, that he says no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, this is the Christian's key confession. This is, what, this is more than just saying Jesus is Lord, because anybody can say Jesus is Lord. But to make Jesus your Lord and actually mean it, that only happens through the Spirit of God. To make Jesus the absolute Lord of your life and to come under his submission and transformation to, to make him your Lord, is that's something that's achieved through the Spirit of God. That means absolute submission to Christ. So nobody is <coughs> making Jesus the Lord of their life, which is the master of their life, unless it's through this transformation that occurs through the Spirit. So to the Jews, this would have been blasphemy against God to say Jesus is their master. That's because God is only one, and you know all, this, the, all the problems they had with that. To the Gentiles, it would have been abandonment of all the other gods, all the other lords. So anybody who proclaims Jesus Christ as the Lord of their life, that is through the Spirit of God. And really, if you think about what the gospel is, that is, it's making, today we don't really, today the, the, it's probably more applicable to say, stop making yourself the Lord of your life and making Jesus the Lord of your life. That happens through the, through the power and the transformation that, that occurs in the Spirit. So, what is the real proof of the Holy Spirit's activity? Was it these, these speaking in tongues and saying, ah, oh, I can speak in tongues and you can, or I have this gift and you don't? No, the real proof of it was saying Jesus is Lord and, and showing that in their life. So, uh, chapter 12, verse 4 through 11, reads like this. It says, now there are varieties of gifts, <coughs> but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, or yours may say workings, but the same God who works all things and all persons. But <coughs> to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by one Spirit. To another the effects or works of miracles to another prophecy, to another distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as He wills. And so notice what He's doing here. He's trying to help them understand that there is a variety of things going on, it's God's will that's, that's making this happen, but everything is unified. That's why I titled the lesson Diversity and Unity. There's diversity, but there's also unity. And, and, and this, this is first uh, demonstrated in the Godhead. Diversity is first demonstrated in the Godhead. There's a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. 
There's a variety of ministries. Ministry also means services, servant, you know, that idea. There's a there's, uh, variety of services, but the same Lord. He's the ultimate servant. servant. There's a variety of workings or effects, uh, but the same God who's working all things in all. And so, really, the Godhead himself, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is, is a diverse God. There's many facets to God. And, that is, and he's also going to demonstrate that diversity in his church as well. So it's not, even though there's no such, you're never going to see a verse in the Bible that says the Trinity, uh, you can see why that idea comes about because in this verse here, he, he's kind of showing you the, the Spirit, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit right in here uh, by, by saying this in three different ways. So diversity within unity is the character of God himself. Three persons, one, one Godhead, Father God, Lord Jesus, the servant Jesus, the Holy Spirit, working all in all. Your translation may say all things in all people, but it's, it's this diverse God in its various ways that's doing all of this, and God is diver, uh, exhibiting this diversity in his body, which is the church. So in, cha in verse 7 he says, to each one is given the manifestation. Now that means a revealing, that's, that's some kind of proof of something. A manifestation is a revealing of something. Each one is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, notice he doesn't say each one's given a gift. Well, that's what he's going to give them, but it's not a gift as in I'm giving you a Christmas present and you can do whatever you want to with it. He's, giving, he's manifesting himself. God is manifesting himself in different ways through different people for the common good. And that is what we need to pick up on. Each manifestation is to benefit everyone. Now, this idea of about common benefit was, was kind of first picked up back in chapter 3, verse 21. I'll read that real quick. Chapter 3, verse 21, where they're, they're boasting one man over another, and he says, Let no one boast of men. All things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All things belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. So this idea of all things belonging to the body for the common benefit is not a new idea that goes back to chapter 3. All these revealings, all the different ways that the Spirit is manifesting itself in different parts of the body is for the common good as well. So there's this diversity that's going on in unity. Now some people view this <coughs> uh, just as a technical list of all the spiritual gifts. But that, is, that would be to miss the point that he's trying to make. He's... He's really, his current concern is their lack of unity. Maybe he's addressing some misuse of specific gifts that the Spirit has exhibited and manifested among them. But we have other such lists of the uh, gifts of the Spirit. Romans 12, 4 through 8. Uh, Ephesians 4, 11, uh, Certain gifts given to the church for the building up of the body. And so I don't think we, we can learn something about spiritual gifts, but we're, we're, we're missing the point if we just say, okay, this is the list of all the spiritual gifts right here. That's not exactly what he was trying to do. Um, he goes on and he says, to one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. So you see the point he's trying to make is that there's diversity, but yet it all goes back to the same God and so there's that unity there as well. Uh, by the way, wisdom and knowledge were the two things that he says they were given all of in, in chapter 1, verse 5. He said, you're given all wisdom. But when he's saying you're not lacking in any gift of grace, you're not lacking in any gift, you have all word and all knowledge. Uh, this is interesting too. What, <clears throat> we, we normally think of faith as something that we supply, right? But here he's, he's listing it in a, in a, uh, a list of spiritual gifts. So I'm not, this kind of troubles a lot of people who study this passage, but what does he say that there's some uh, special measure of faith? Perhaps. And, um, because, you know, we're all, we're all expected to believe or put our trust in God. But in chapter 13 and verse 2, he, he kind of exhibits um, a list of uh, spiritual things here, and he includes faith with it. In 13.2 he says, If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. So you see how he's, he's listing uh, prophecy, uh, mysteries, knowledge, and faith all through there. 
I think this must be some kind of miraculous measure of faith. If you have some idea about that, um, maybe faith to move mountains or something like that, I'm not really sure. But the others are more clear, like gifts of healing, uh, working of miracles, prophecy, discernment of spirits. That was a spiritual gift, being able to discern if that was really from the Spirit of God. And then what really he gets to is, the, I think, probably the current problem here at the end is the tongues and the interpretation of tongues. He's going to hit this again at the, at later in verse uh, 27 and through, through uh, 28 of, of chapter 12. He's going to pick it back up in chapter 14 when he talks about the use of the tongues and in, in, in prophecy inside the assembly. So I think he was kind of give, going through a different laundry list of things, and then he ends up with the, the thing that he's about to directly address here, <coughs> which is the tongues and interpretation of tongues that they were thinking was the, the greatest gift. But in chapter 12, verse 11, he says, And one and the same Spirit works all these things. So there's that diversity and unity again. Distributing to each one individually just as he wills. So it's God's will that this diversity happens. And I think the focus here is on this unity that occurs, but also it's the will of God. He places each of us in the body just as he wills. He gives us all unique abilities just as he wills. And so I, even though we don't see all these manifestations like was in the first Corinthians, uh, the, the Corinthian church in the first century, I think God still works the same way where he puts us in the body as he wills and he gives us different abilities like he will. So the question we need to ask <coughs> is are we really aware that God uses each of us differently? I think we probably say yes, but I don't know that we always appreciate the diversity that, that occurs. We think, oh, if somebody's different from me, then, you know, that they should be more like me or I should be more like them. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe we need to appreciate uh, the diversity a little bit more. And, and the, the other question I have is, do we have the unity even though that we are so diverse? Do we really experience that kind of unity that God wants through our diversity? Now, you could take this the wrong way and say, well, we're just going to tolerate everything. I'm not talking about tolerance. I'm just talking about appreciating each of our unique abilities in Christ because it's been given uh, through the Spirit for our common good. So the next thing I want to look at here is, is this 12 through 14, which is the last section of text. He says, For even as the body is one, <coughs> and yet has many members, and all members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. <coughs> now that's a mouthful, but if you just kind of <coughs> broke this sentence down, he's trying to make an analogy. He, you've probably played these games when you were little, that uh, this is to this as this is to this. Well, to break that sentence down, he's saying, for even as the body is blank, so also is Christ. He's trying to compare how Christ and the body, or his church, uh, and, and really Christ is, is um, a metaphor for the church. Uh, and that'll be, that'll be played out if you look down in verse 27 where he says, now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. He's talking about the body here. So for even as our physical body is something, so also is the church. Well, what's the common? In common is we both have different parts, but yet we work together. And that's the analogy. We have many different body parts, the word here is called uh, members, I think, in this translation, but technically it's members is translated as limbs. We have many limbs or many, many different body parts, but we're unified into one body. And this expresses our need for diversity. <coughs> so I think sometimes the way I used to look at this, and, and I'll just admit, is I, I used to, to look at this passage as the need for unity, I think his focus is on the necessity of diversity, if that makes sense. Because um, he's saying, even as the body has many members, so also Christ's body has many different members, many different kinds of members. And that's what they needed to be reminded of here, uh, to have to, that the importance of all this different diversity, but also be unified at the same time. Uh, so, so how can such diversity have real unity? And that's what I asked uh, before. Well, he tells us in verse 13. He says, For by one Spirit we've all been baptized into one body, or immersed into one body. 
And we and in, look at uh, later on. He says, "And all made to drink of one spirit." So again, we have one spirit mentioned twice in this verse. We're baptized into the body by that spirit. We're all made to drink from that spirit, <clears throat> just like we all drink of one cup. No, no, we don't technically drink of one cup, but we're all drinking of the blood of Christ together in that communion, that oneness. Ephesians 5, um, verse 18, talks about not being drunk with wine, but being drunk with the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, and that drinking from it. <clears throat> and so, regardless of their differences, Jews, Greeks, slave, free, they're all supposed to be drinking of one Spirit, which is supposed to unify them. Now, I used to look at this verse, and, and this was a, vo- a go-to verse for baptism, right? Baptized into one body. But that's really not the point of his verse. The point is not being baptized into one body, but the point is the unifying power of, of the Spirit to bring them all together into one body. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that he's trying to get them to focus on spiritual things rather than the physical things throughout the whole book. These people are claiming to be spiritual people, but the, the fruit of their actions is not very spiritual. The Holy Spirit had given them gifts, but they're not using them in a way that would be pleasing to God. It wasn't, they weren't thinking spiritual. So he's encouraging them to go back to the source of their unity, I believe, which is to be, to be in the Spirit of God, to be you know, according to His will, uh, we, by one spirit we were all baptized into one body we're all made, we're created or made to drink from one spirit and so the emphasis is on the spirit of God which uh, makes us one and is received by <coughs> all Christians we're supposed to have the mind of Christ and be living in God's will uh, the spirit reveals what he wills uh, through the word of God obviously so does this mean that the body now is, is one member? well no it's not uh, because we're drinking of one spirit doesn't mean that we're just all one part again. So that's why there's this, there's this necessity for this diversity in unity. And he says it again in chapter 12, verse 14, for the body is not one member, it's many. And the body here refers to Christ's church, as we talked about in verse 27. So the point is, is that variety is normal, and it's God's will, and it benefits everyone. I don't just take my gift and just benefit myself and, and like they were doing and and exalt myself. You see many people in the church that they have some ability and they're arrogant about it. You know, and, and everybody knows they're arrogant about it because, you know, like, I'm going to teach all the Bible classes or I'm going to do all this or I'm, I'm the only one that can do that. And, and if you encroach into my little space, uh, they get really protective. Uh, there's probably many different examples where we think about people who have gifts, but they're not really thinking about using them to benefit everyone. So in closing... And I hope that you might come up to me and talk to me about this later if you have any questions. But I think that the, the main takeaways that we need to come from this lesson is that diversity is part of God's divine plan in the body. So we shouldn't be trying to stress conformity. Uh, conformity to God's word, yes, but not, con- not everybody, that's not going to exhibit the same way to in every person. Every, we have to allow room for each person's uh, unique gifts to come through and exercise get God's divine plan. Diversity, in fact, is essential for a healthy church. If we don't, if we don't encourage that diversity and, and, and God's will through that, we're not going to be a healthy church. That was God's plan for the church. And diversity is also for the benefit <coughs> of the whole body. It's not just for the benefit of myself. So, in closing, do we appreciate this diversity that is occurring in our members? And, and next week we're going to be talking about uh, the problem with not appreciating that because some are more visible than others some look more some gifts look more attractive than others we'll pick up there about how some seem more honorable and some seem less honorable Uh, this guy seems like he can do so much and this person doesn't seem like they can do much that shows that we're not really appreciating the different parts of the body so do we appreciate that diversity and are we using our unique gifts to benefit the church are we using our unique abilities that God's given us to benefit the body If we're not doing that, then we're using those selfishly. And in closing, I think most everyone here is, uh, but are you a part of this spiritual body? Are you contributing to it? Uh, I really want us to think about this question, since most of us here today are Christians, is that we may not be having these um, 
<coughs> what we would consider these supernatural manifestations, uh, like, like, like they saw exactly in the, in the first uh, century church. But what we do see is God manifesting his grace on us in different ways. And we need to realize that it's a stewardship given not just to benefit ourselves, but for the common good. And how well are we doing that? I hope we'll reflect on that this week. I hope that we'll reflect on that today and this week and uh, be praying to God about that, how, how he can help us to see that more clearly, how we can be drinking more uh, of that spirit, that one spirit that's supposed to unify us. Uh, it's kind of a hard teaching, just like we were studying in John. You know, how do you eat the flesh? <laughs> you know, how do you, and he was saying, well, the spirit brings life, and his words are spirit and life. So the more that we consume his words, the more we're going to be consuming of that spirit that gives life and brings unity as well. If we can do anything for anyone or if you need the prayers of the saints, <coughs> I believe there's a song of invitation that is God is calling the prodigal. And uh, I think it's an appropriate song because some of us may have been taking our gifts that God's given us and we went on our way to spend them on our own, our own joys and our own delights. And... Uh, what I'm inviting us all to do and what God wants us to do is to come back to him. And uh, he's ready to embrace us with open arms. If anyone needs to repent of anything or make their sins known publicly or come to Christ for the first time, we invite you to do so as we stand and sing. <laughs>